and such a pretty day, but I guarantee you won't be disappointed uh, with our last two presenters. Uh, first off this afternoon is uh, Dr. Bradley Schaefer. He is a professor of genetics and pediatrics at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. He's the founding director of the Division of Medical Genetics and the chief of the section of genetics and me metabolism in the Department of Pediatrics at UAMS. He's also the medical director of the genetic counseling training program at UAMS. He is the inaugural holder of the Committee for the Future Endowed Chair in Medical Genetics. He has authored over 250 scientific articles, books, chapters, and invited reviews. He is on the editorial board of the Journal of Child Neurology, sits on the National Advisory Board for the SOTOS Syndrome Support Association. His clinical and research interests focus on the genetics of neurodevelopment, neurosensory, and neurobehavioral disorders, craniofacial genetics, medical transition for the children with special health care needs, telegenetic services, yay, and newborn screening follow-up uh, in infrastructure. And I can tell you, uh, we, when the Center for Distance Health heard that uh, Dr. Schaefer was coming to Arkansas, uh, we immediately, you know, do what everybody does. We Googled, you know, and, but I, I can tell you our genetics people knew exactly who was coming and how lucky we were. So we, are, we have a true treasure here, uh, having Dr. Schaefer here in Arkansas and his graphs of the telemedicine program and utilizing it. So with that, I'll give it to you, Dr. Schaefer. He left that up there on purpose. <laughs> well, it's late in the afternoon, and again, I, with the weather outside, I would have been surprised if it was just been me and the three of us talking, so I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, end of a conference, uh, this type of weather, let's be real informal. I'm just going to talk a little bit. Uh, what I was asked to talk about is essentially what's going on in telegenetics in Arkansas. Um, an audience like this, of course, I don't have to have all the introductory slides about what is telehealth and those sort of things. Um, so just to give you a feel for, uh, again, kind of the lay of the land, genetics may be a specialty that you guys don't always interface with, but a lot of blah blah here to essentially just say that there ain't enough of us. And really that's, you know, true for many of us, and particularly people that work with children with special health care needs, people who are in pediatric subspecialties, um, that uh, as you can see there, the ratio of geneticists to children one per 5.7 million. So there's uh, not a lot of us. And so um, for those of you that are here in Arkansas, uh, we just added our seventh geneticist. The state has 3.3 million people so that you can see that the uh, ratio that we have is obviously tremendously better than that. And that really is, as Michael was saying, just the commitment of the university um, recruiting me down here and, and sharing the vision that this is what they wanted. Uh, and um, five years later, we're where we would like to be, um, one of the really bigger genetics programs in the country these days. Um, of course, the other thing is that uh, uh, if you read my whole kind of professional career, you'd essentially see that the middle swath of the country is where I've stayed, uh, trained and started my first faculty job, at, mostly in Oklahoma, 20 years in Nebraska, and now I've been here for five years. So the, um, the Plains states, if you would, or whatever we want to call ourselves, Heartlands or whatever, um, represents a really unique challenge in delivery of specialty services. Um, that you can see that, again, on a population basis that we have lots of uh, space and not so many people. Um, so uh, that protects a particular challenge. Now, by way of disclaimer, there were supposed to be three of us. Uh, and I get to expand into that, and so my expansion is I do want to then take a couple steps back and kind of give you the uh, even the bigger view of my role in telegenetics and essentially go back to 1995. If you were at the morning session, Dr. Palaha, this is back when she and I were both faculty members there, um, and the early days, at least for us, in basically doing telegenetics, telepsychology uh, services. This is a, a fantastic slide. I, I know you can't read it, but living here in Arkansas, being the natural state, uh, one of the things that's just amazing to me is how beautiful it is here. Uh, Jody and I used to do these clinics. This is out in western Nebraska. We used to drive eight, 700 miles to get to a satellite clinic in western Nebraska and then cut up and go to uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, and then come all the way around. So about a 1,700-mile loop that we would do six times a year. Um, and you can't read this, but this is so cool. I had to stop and take this sign. This says right here, this says Nebraska National Forest, and there's an arrow going right there. <laughs> so uh, so it, it, it is uh, a very different demography here. Again, back to that, uh, that map um, in Nebraska. 
there's 1.7 million people in a state that is 500 miles long and 300 miles tall. So the state health department classifies counties as urban, rural, and frontier. And a frontier county is one that has less than six people per square mile, and there are 11 of those in Nebraska. So uh, literally we had um, children that were 120 miles away from the closest quick stop. And they lived in counties uh, as big as Northwest Arkansas, uh, in which there were no physicians, no county health department, uh, and no uh, special uh, providers. So uh, represents a really a specific challenge for trying to get what we do out to these patients. Sorry, going the wrong way. So, um, so one of the things that, again, that when I was in Nebraska was that we had, um, we, I worked at a place called the Monroe Meyer Institute, and the full name was the Monroe Meyer Institute for Re Rehabilitation and Genetics. And so it was a very cool mixture, and the, the boss, uh, our, all of our boss was a guy named Bruce Bueller, who was a geneticist, but he understood special health care needs kids, and so our institute had genetics, pediatric neurology, developmental pediatrics, OTPT, psych, uh, nutrition, developmental pediatrics, all under one roof and one boss. And so it was a very nurturing environment for really true interdisciplinary care. Um, again, Jody, who spoke earlier, she's a child psychologist. I'll tell you, Jody's a really good dysmorphologist, too, because she drove the roads of Nebraska with us and saw us uh, see a lot of kids. It was also incredibly good for a geneticist to have uh, behavioral people with us because one of the things is you see the kid, you make the diagnosis and say the child has Williams syndrome, and then the mom looks at you and goes, well, great, but I can't get him to quit pooping. And you say, great, I'd like you to talk to Dr. Palaha. And so uh, <laughs> it was nice to have a pee-pee-poo-poo -poo doctor with me and then I could <laughs> turf those things very quickly. Um, but what then we did is that, as you might imagine, uh, driving uh, across Nebraska and South Dakota, particularly in January, is a, an adventure to itself. Uh, many blizzards we've been caught in. My wife still laughs at me today. I still keep all of my snow gear in the back of my Durango. Uh, and she says, Brad, you're in Arkansas now. I said, yeah, but it just could happen, you know. <laughs> and so once you've been stuck in 14 feet of snow, uh, which it did one day, uh, it snowed a foot an hour for 14 hours on our trip going from... Uh, Scotts Bluff to Rapid City, and so when you get caught out in the middle of nowhere in 14 feet of snow, I never take another chance. But so we said, okay, rather than taking my car and running across the frozen north, what can we do? And so again, the uh, Department of Health, uh, through a Title V grant, funded a statewide network for children with special health care needs. And so again, with our uh, rehab institute, with all these multidisciplines involved, we were then able to, as we had been doing, which was take these services on the road. And then we began to look at, okay, how much of this can, uh, driving can we eliminate, and how much of this can be done by, by telemedicine services. And here you can see a fairly decent hub and spoke model of telehealth services that we could do. Again, I, can you guys see the cursor? Yeah, again, I, I just can't tell you how godforsaken this is right in here. I mean, the, I mean, there is just nothing but, this is what's called the Sand Hill area. I mean, there's people that live 100 miles from the next nearest person, right? And, this typical stoic Nebraska farmer guy who basically says four words to his wife a week because he has to, uh, and otherwise just sit out in the dirt and don't do anything. It's crazy. So um, getting services out in these regions, you can even see here that uh, even finding a place to put a telemedicine site was, was quite difficult. But we did the best we could. Um, the second thing is we got another a nice grant from the APDST uh, on medical transition. Um, this is one of the great disappointments of my life and that we put six years into this project, built it up, it was really one of the coolest programs we did, and then when I left, they just let it drop. And so it was really sad, but what we were doing is that we have this protocol for um, healthcare transition for children with special healthcare needs, and it was a um, three-step process that involved ascertaining the kids when they were 14 to 15 years age, um, developing a transition plan so that everything was done by the time they were 21, and then assigning them a healthcare navigator to not just put a plan in their hands, but have somebody to help the family walk through it with them. Um, and so this was the kind of the complicated algorithm we went through. Um, and again, we did this for children across the state of Nebraska. Um, again, this was kind of the first time that I really sat down and said, yes, this stuff works, and you can really do complicated things. Um, this is a, obviously a child who has a very specific uh, motility needs, uh, and we were able to do his services. Um, he is primarily Spanish-speaking. 
um, but he speaks kind of his own dialect, and so even standard translators were hard to do. So we were able to actually have him in our clinic with our docs and our therapists, and then actually then telemedicine in his local family translator, which was basically his aunt who spoke this kind of uh, hybridized language with him. And so again, we can have, uh, on this visit, he actually saw 14 specialists. Um, and again, it was all done by, by telemedicine services. Uh, and again, this is him at 18 years of age, and um, by the time I left, at least, he had transitioned and it was in a good uh, situation for his adult care. Um, the third thing that we did is that uh, we also then participated in this thing that was called the Flat Flatlands Disability Network. Um, if you think things are barren in Nebraska, uh, all you have to do is go to North Dakota and realize you got it really good. Um, and so, again, be with a, a place like the Monroe Meyer Institute, uh, we contracted out with the Department of Health and Human Services into uh, these, what is it, eight sites, I think it was, that we were going into North Dakota. Uh, the state of North Dakota had a half of an FTE of a geneticist, very limited services, again, even more sparsely populated parts of the world up in North Dakota. And so, again, we were able to take our group of um, habilitation and rehabilitation specialists and work with the children with special health care needs. This was a, an interesting one. This was actually a professional consultation grant, which was, again, we were putting our specialists in touch with their providers and then essentially providing then uh, how-to sort of things, not dissimilar to what Dr. Lowry's doing with his perinatal network here in the ANGELS program. And so, again, this is for kids with disabilities. Another thing that we did is, and, and I think the closest Shriners Hospital, I think there's what, one in Shreveport and one in St. Louis here for those of us in, in uh, Arkansas. In Nebraska, the closest Shriners Hospital was in Minneapolis. And so again, for many of our children, once again, you had problems with, or not problems, but just logistical issues of a child who goes to Minneapolis, gets his scoliosis surgery, um, recovers, and then needs to go back every th three to four weeks for x-rays and rechecks and those sort of things. Uh, again, I am so sorry about that. <laughs> you would die. This is my mother. I'm going to hang up on her here. <laughs> sorry, Ma. <laughs> don't talk to her. No, don't tell my mom. <laughs> um, so, again, we ran into these issues where, again, the Shriners organization is a quality organization. It was, it was good for our patients to be able to get the type of services they offer and, of course, at the, the cost, which was fantastic. Uh, and so, again, what we did is we set up a cooperative agreement with Shriners Hospital. Um, this is a pretty unimpressive looking room, but that machine in there is a uh, $100,000 machine because it has a total uh, automated x-ray reader, medical records reader, and a um, fax and uh, F, uh, PDF file generators sort of thing, essentially, so you could take the entire medical record and transmit it across there and see the child. And so what we're able to do then is work out a contract with Shriners so that uh, the kids could get their surgeries in Minneapolis and then the families could come into Omaha and again, get all their follow-up visits through this. And so again, it was a nice cooperative agreement, sharing of information, and again, uh, what we're all about when these things is, of course, is, is meeting patients' needs and making it uh, simpler for them. Um, this, you've heard, I don't know how much Jody talked about that. I skipped out on the first part of her talk. I'm sorry, those little blueberry muffins just looked way too good. So, um, but this is what Jody was talking about that we also did then in, in um, Nebraska, which is this pediatric behavioral telehealth services. Again, had a very active group that she was part of with our child psychologist. Uh, and again, we uh, could then do behavioral services across telehealth, ser um, telehealth uh, mechanisms. Uh, again, if I'm repeating things, I apologize, but we found a lot of early cool lessons with this, um, particularly for the kids with behavioral problems. It was amazing how well this worked. Um, one of the best examples were the kids with uh, ADHD. Uh, and you'd have these chil children that were incredibly hyperactive and, and very disruptive, and yet when we would do the telemedicine visits, they'd sit there for 30, 40 minutes and never move. And they were just fascinated that the TV was talking to them. And so the moms would say, this, this never happens. And yet, you know, the little fat doctor's at the other end, and I'm going, hi. And they thought it was cool that, that the doctor talked to them. So we were able really to, to do a lot of um, particularly follow-up services through this method. The last thing, um, again, that was very cool in Nebraska is that um, the, the whole idea of being electronically linked uh, really has no limits. In fact, one of the 
other organizations that uses a lot of telehealth services have been things related to the military and the government and astronauts and those sort of things. So, for instance, you may have seen the story of the lady in Antarctica who had breast cancer and basically did her own breast biopsy by somebody coaching her by telemedicine. Well, we had one of our cytogenetic technologists whose brother uh, went on the second to the last space shuttle. And um, so we were able then to take our telemedicine network and uh, hook him up to his brother on Saturday morning so he could come in and talk to the space shuttles just through our system. Again, it was just a matter of routing, having the right IP addresses, and then, of course, having the, the federal clearance. And so this guy is the brother of, of our technologist there. You can see, again, that two of the astronauts, one was from Iowa, one was from Nebraska. That's our Nebraska guy there. Um, and then one of the really cool uh, side uh, events from all this is that this guy really appreciated me letting his brother talk to him on Saturday mornings, and he sent me some of the most amazing pictures you've ever seen. That's Hurricane Felix from uh, seen from outer space. I've got you know other cool pictures of how the crap did that happen? Um, uh, pier seeing the pyramids, the Great Wall of China, all these sort of things taken from there. He's actually even got a. I, I wasn't going to bore you with all the pictures, but I got a great picture of the University of Nebraska playing football, uh, <laughs> where you can just see the sea of red on this football stadium from uh, up in the space. So. Um, so really, the, the bottom line is, is that um, you can get into pretty much any place that you want to get into, um, given the right sort of uh, ba basically clearances and those sort of things. So technology really is not the limiting factor these days. Uh, I'm sad to say that the main limiting factor is policy. And so again, one of the things we run into uh, these days really is things like um, medical licenses, and even worse, credentialing, right? That, uh, that each hospital has to make their own decision about credentialing. So in theory, if, um, if I wanted to talk to all 100 hospitals here in Arkansas, if they didn't agree to this cooperative agreement, I would actually have to have hospital credentials in every hospital in order to do my services there. So um, it is quite difficult. So that's what we did in Nebraska, and so um, I came here, as was just said, that I came here with a fair amount of experience in this, then couple that with just how remarkably um, developed the infrastructure is here, what the Centers for Distance Health has done. Uh, this was, uh, again, I was like a, coming into a big boys Wii station here. I mean, this is like cool. I mean, I can do telegenetics. You guys are all set up. And so I really appreciate the chance to be here. Um, and this is the map right now of the telehealth units that we've been into, uh, which is almost all of them. And you can see, uh, if you know, many of you don't know Arkansas, but this really covers most of the, the bigger population areas, some of the least populated areas, but they're strategic. Um, ultimately, it would be not, we, we would like to start putting some more units in places. My ultimate goal would be that there wouldn't be a kid in Arkansas that's more than 20 minutes away from a site. And so that, again, we can limit the amount of travel that people have to do. Um, one of the things that's, that's my great passion is uh, underserved populations. And um, the degree of poverty that we see in Arkansas is just mind boggling. I mean, Nebraska is not a rich state, but basically there's just kind of a nice base there. Um, the, the first time that I saw a patient and ordered some genetic tests and said, I need you to come back and see me in six weeks to discuss the test results. And the family said, I can't do that. It costs us $25 in gas. We don't have $25 more. We'll start collecting cans again. And when we've saved up $25, I'll come back and see you. Um, that was just a, an eye-opening experience. And now that I've been here five years, it's not a unique experience. And so, um, again, if we're going to truly break down uh, some of these barriers to access and those sort of things, uh, that, that we absolutely have to take advantage of these things. And so our goal then is to make sure that uh, all kids in Arkansas can really access the special services that we want to give them. What we do f uh, by these services is, of course, we're a genetics group, uh, hence the term telegenetics. Um, we do um, primary or follow-up visits. Um, absolutely, I mean, we've quit doing customers, uh, you know, satisfaction surveys and that sort of stuff. It's just universal. Nobody... I mean, they may not like me. If they don't like me, that they're not going to like me in face or on telehealth, and so that's really not the issue. Otherwise, we just get universal great feedback. Uh, if people don't have to travel, they're, they're happy. We really are finding uh, zero sort of um, unhappiness with the services. Nobody says, I'm, you know, I wish I'd have seen you in person. And in fact, my wife always tells me I've got a face for radio anyway, so it would probably be better if we just do the audio without the video. But... 
Um, we can do primary visits. One of the things we did when we were up in Nebraska is, you know, everybody, when they do these sort of things, one of the things about physicians, you know, is we get that kind of MDT complex and we think that, uh, that, you know, there's nothing like us in our healing hands. And so one of the questions is, you know, can I do this well without physically touching a patient? And so we started by doing telemedicine visits and then on these loops that I was telling you about when we would drive across the state, we'd see the patients again. And we'd basically say, okay, now I'm seeing them in person, how's that working? Uh, and again, after about six months, we quit doing that because we could not find any situation where we missed anything, where we said, oh, if I had been with that kid, I'd have seen something differently or done something different. So we feel a high degree of confidence that we can do these services just as well by distance as we can by uh, personal visits. Um, other things, that, again, that are kind of some of these unexpected spinoffs I talked about, like the kids with ADHD kind of enjoying it. Um, again, I, I'm out of my league talking with behavioral specialists. You're going to hear from one here in just a minute. But kind of something that's interesting that we found, too, is that sometimes things that are of great gravity um, seem to go better by telemedicine. And so, for instance, when we see patients in our uh, cancer genetics clinics and we say, okay, you've got a positive family history of breast cancer, and we draw the breast cancer gene testing and say, okay, in four weeks we're going to have results and we want to give you these results back, uh, one of the questions people ask was, oh, if you do this by telemedicine, is that going to seem cold and distant and all those sort of things? And it turns out that, again, that the patient feedback we get was, you know, it wasn't so bad that you weren't there, right? And I'm, I was fine with you giving me the information by the, the video. Uh, I felt comfortable with that kind of distancing and those sort of things. And so telling them that they have the breast cancer gene or telling somebody that they are test positive for Huntington's disease um, has turned out to be, again, a very... Um, very doable sort of thing. Um, when I say there that the on-site support is preferable for something like Huntington's disease, we'll make sure that there, for instance, it may be a behavioral counselor with the patient at the other end. So that uh, the, if there is the need, again, for that kind of support, we can do that. So, but again, we, we really feel that, uh, that it's working well. I always joke with the medical students, first week that I get them in class, and basically say, you know, genetics is a wonderful medical specialty because there really aren't too many genetic emergencies. Nobody calls me and goes, quick, quick, he's mutating or anything like that. Um, but indeed, there are times when, when there are urgencies, and urgencies in genetics can include a lot of things. Uh, again, it was, it was mentioned earlier today that uh, the, the tele-nursery projects we have, it, again, it's very reassuring to the families and to the doctors if the geneticists can talk to them that day rather than come see us in four weeks when the kid gets discharged. Or particularly with some of these NICU babies, you know, some of those stays are two or three months long. And so to sit and wait for three months for the kid to finally get out of the NICU and then get your appointment into genetics, uh, that we can get into the nurseries uh, at any point in time. Uh, and so this helps with, again, triage, you know, does the child need to be transported? I think Mike mentioned earlier today, uh, families in which we're able to say, no, you don't have to be transported, right? And we can save these kids from having to come down here. Uh, we can help the docs with management. And of course, what we in genetics like to do best is, is make uh, di good diagnoses. And so all these things can be done um, on a very urgent basis. And again, you know, urgency is really not even defined oftentimes by medical urgency, but I think there's also the psychosocial urgency. Sometimes just, um, you know, those delivery room surprises, uh, those are tough. And uh, again, waiting is, is very difficult on the families. Um, as far as, again, the, the science of dysmorphology, which is identifying syndromes and making those diagnoses, as I've said, uh, this is the slide I was alluding to, that we can, we can do this. We've done our own little case controls. Nothing's missed. And so here's a girl with Soto syndrome that, again, you know, I mean, this is the, this is the screen capture from our televideo unit. That's really high quality, right? I mean, you don't have to worry about, am I seeing what I need to see? Um, you know, I have a total grasp of what this girl looks like. And, of course, even this is just a still capture, but when you've got streaming video and, Again, in, you know, in 1995, it was, um, it was not as good a technology, right? It was like one of those bad Godzilla movies, you know, and the, the families go, and you says, hi, Dr. Shaver, how are you? You know, and so you'd always interrupt each other and stop each other and that sort of stuff. But now uh, the, the systems we have are so, they're this clear, they're real time, they're, they're ongoing dialogue. So again, it works as well as any sort of face-to-face -face visit that you want to make. Um, this is, uh, again, from a presentation we, um, I think I'll get to that in a minute, but we do an outreach telegenetics clinic in Wichita, Kansas. 
and this is one of our families and uh, one of the moms basically gave us this quote which this, these are some of those kids that they were just absolutely fascinated that uh, that the doctor was talking to them and one of the other very funny things about kids and telemedicine sort of visits is uh, how often they will walk behind the screen looking for me uh, because they're, they're wondering where I'm at and so they go walking around and and then also they really like to get their nose up in the camera so I always get a very good intranasal examination so uh, we can do that as well uh, we also can do ongoing therapies and management. Um, we can, are you moving because, I, I didn't see the yellow sign, am I okay on time? Uh, about another minute. I just got one more minute? Oh, wait, quit. Okay, therapies, outreach, we go to Wichita. Uh, there, right now is there no geneticists in Kansas? And so we do uh, clinics in Wichita, sitting here by outreach. Here's again me sitting in my conference room seeing patients in Wichita, Kansas. There's the other side of it, so there's the patients in Wichita. The lady standing up as a genetic counselor then, so I've got an on-site person who is able to facilitate the visits with me. Uh, and again, with no geneticists in the state of Kansas, again, sitting in Arkansas, this is the, the catchment area of patients that we're seeing. And so again, people in Kansas uh, can, can at least be seen by a geneticist. Um, what we've been trying then most recently then has been to say, okay, you know, I'm only on there two times a month. That's not a lot of genetic time for the whole state of Kansas. So we've been getting some grant dollars to look at developing algorithms of basically having a pediatrician pre-screen the patients. Uh, we, we set up protocols and algorithms so that some of the stuff can be done ahead of time. We're able to basically double our efficiency with that. There's our little protocol thing for who does what and it speeds things up. We also do distance education. Our genetic counseling training program started as a four-state consortium uh, with our entire curriculum being uh, online based. Uh, and then even the last thing uh, is that um, for about 20 years now we've done uh, telegenetics conferencing on difficult cases. And so we have 25 sites when we have uh, difficult cases. So we've got people in Harvard and Duke and Wisconsin and all over and I get 25 geneticists. And so I always tell families I can get you another 25 opinions for free. <laughs> so in summary, current technology, basically anything I do, I'm not a surgeon, right? I don't have to physically have my hands on there. Anything that I do as a clinician, I can do by telemedicine. Um, there are a lot of things that we can do. You understand the benefits, we've already talked about those. And then the basic challenges, again, one of the great advantages moving to Arkansas uh, is that basically none of those challenges that a lot of people experience do I have here. So it's been a very nice marriage of my past experience and just the wonderful way that Arkansas is wired. So um, it's been good to be here. Last slide, I promise, is that then, so because we've done a nice enough job with it, then uh, through a HRSA grant project, we have written the telemedicine manual for genetic services uh, for the country. So uh, we, we think we do it well enough that we can smart off and tell everybody else how to do it too. Thank you.